Before we get to your questions, we've got samples. And Fred, I think you have two samples actually on the, off the same plant with different issues. Yes. So let's start out with uh, Bug of the Week, uh, which are rose slugs, a very common malady right now on many of our roses. And what we see is a sort of a defoliation, a stripping of the upper surface of the leaf, although they feed on both the upper and lower surface. Let me show you the culprits here. So here they are, and these are fully grown. They've just about finished their life cycle. We can see them on the, on the leaf. And you know, they, they look like, they're called rose slugs, and they look kind of like a slug. They aren't even closely related to a slug. Uh, they look more like a, a caterpillar, which they aren't either. They are actually the larva of a primitive wasp called a sawfly, hmm. right? And the good news is that makes them very easy to control. Uh, so if you see them, one of the best thing to do is maybe to, to pick off the leaflet and just dispose of that leaflet. You can, uh, you could actually just sort of brush them off into some soapy water, or you could spray with them with almost anything, an insecticidal soap, an oil if the plant, a horticultural oil, uh, something like uh, seven uh, or permethrin, any of those would work very well to control them. And the other is more of a nature's wondrous pageantry, although it can become a problem. And these are called spiny rose galls, all right? And, and they're really cool galls, and these are caused by uh, a, another wasp, okay, called a gall wasp. And so inside of these will be, a, the little larva would be feeding, and these will get, oh, an inch in diameter. They can get very large, and they aren't really sharp, uh, but they're a little spiny here. And again, uh, for the most part, they don't hurt the plant unless they are very abundant. Uh, actually, I leave them because sometimes they turn really pretty in the fall. But you want to remove them. You want to remove them over the winter because the larva overwinters within that gall. So if you leave them, they will, you'll reinfest those same plants. So you, know, you often see large numbers of these. So Perfect. spiny rose gall uh, and rose slug. Thank you, Fred. Fun stuff. <clears throat> okay, Lowell. It's it's a vine it's night. It's time. Yeah, vine night. it's vine night. Um, I brought in um, field bindweed is the first one I brought in. It's blooming right now uh, in a lot of turf uh, areas and unmanaged areas. Uh, uh, if you see white, uh, purplish uh, to pinkish blooms, there's a very good chance it's uh, field bindweed, and you can see those blooms there, and maybe you can see the almost spade-shaped uh, leaf. I, I call it kind of a, a spade shape on that. It is a perennial. Um, we're getting kind of out of this. This vine here is probably about two two feet long, and best time for control is when uh, the vines are. Uh, probably about six inches uh, in length. So this is getting a little big. It's, we're getting to the warmer time of the year. Uh, we like to, use, because it is a perennial, we like to use um, growth regulator uh, herbicide that contains active ingredient triclopyr uh, on that. And one application is probably not uh, adequate. Uh, persist, being persistent is about the only way to uh, have a chance against uh, field bindweed. And then the second one I brought in, um, I brought this in uh, to show folks um, uh, what this plant looks like when it's small. And this is burr cucumber. Uh, you can see almost the five-sided leaf on that. This one's an annual. It produces seed uh, every year. And you can see the really uh, kind of cool tendrils uh, on here. This is almost like uh, springs or wire. And that's what it wraps around things as it grows up, uh, up a tree, um, up a plant in a, in a landscape. And um, about two months from now, we will get probably some frantic calls about this vine literally growing up over 30 foot tall trees and what can we do now. Um, if you had that last year, these plants are about this big right now. Right now is a great time to look underneath where you had them last year and get rid of them now. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Kevin, boxwood. Yes, I have a boxwood with some very interesting symptoms. Um, if we look um, at the top side, the upper leaf surface, um, we'll see some flecking or some small spots you can clearly see. Um, in every way, this looks like it could be a fungal disease. Uh, when we flip the leaf over on the bottom side of the leaf, uh, we can see a quite a bit larger lesion that's got a pretty prominent um, margin, a darker margin. Um, it's confined around the mid vein. It starts from the mid vein and circles outward. 
Um, so what we're dealing with here is actually drought stress. But the reason I wanted to show this sample is because um, a lot of people will confuse this with a fungal disease. It looks like a fungal disease in, in so many ways. So uh, if we can focus in on, on one of those lesions, actually two of those lesions on the back side of a leaf, um, <clears throat> what happens is that there's a secondary fungus that will come in and sporulate. And so we can see the sporulations um, as these little small black dots that form. Um, it has it in this lesion and it does not in this lesion. So you can see the difference there. Um, so this fungus, like I said, is secondary. You'll never see those black spots in the green healthy tissue. They only produce um, these fruiting bodies in the already dead tissue. So it's not warranted to um, spray with any kind of a fungicide. Um, the best plan of action if you have this um, on your boxwood is just to um, maintain adequate soil moisture um, and maybe Prune, prune the plant up a little bit to increase airflow um, within the canopy to reduce the likelihood of that, that fungus encroaching on the dead materials. Thank you, Kevin. <coughs> and you have beauty. Well, I have no sporulation or <laughs> galls. <laughs> Maybe it's a bit galling that I don't have anything like that. I guess I have two plants here tonight. This one here we'll look at first. This is a vine, so along with vine night here there on Backyard go. Farmer. This is a gold flame honeysuckle. And Kim and I were talking earlier just how plants are flowering. It just seems like the flowers are lasting Gorgeous. forever because we've had some decent rains and good temperatures and not strong winds. So a lot of our plants, I'm sure everybody's having that at their homes. So this is a vine that <clears throat> I've had for a couple of years. It's growing on a fence and it gets a little bit of shade from a nearby sugar maple, but it's really doing really well this year. And then this is a airwood viburnum that I collected. It's actually some seed propagated little plant and it's finally getting about four or five feet tall and, and it's just kind of a bright light out in the landscape right now. It's this one bright white flowering plant. So it's kind of fun right now. What, what is it? Is there a fragrance to the flowers? It's a bit stinky. Okay, so, <laughs> so it's probably fly pollinated. Probably that. Probably there we go. Fly pollinated. Okay. There you yeah. Go. So it's yeah. not strong, but you know, yeah. when I was out in the yard, I thought, what is that smell? It's and not like realized. Korean spice. No, it's not like Korean spice. Yeah. Right. All right. Thank you, Jeff. And I believe, Fred, you probably have the first picture tonight. Okay. And the first questions associated with that. And we've had this already, so this might be a good year. But <laughs> oh, we have a lot of questions one. about grubs. <coughs> and, Getting to that time. And how the birds kind of tear things up going after them. And, and what really is the treatment right now? What should people be doing, if anything? Well, really, the, the primary grub that we have in Nebraska is an annual white grub. Uh, it's a southern mass chafer larva. And... You know, they, right now, the, the adults are getting ready to, uh, you know, they're developing in the soil, and it won't be until really around the 4th of July that those beetles come out, and they're the little tan uh, June beetles that we see, uh, and uh, they'll be laying their eggs back into the soil for this next generation of grubs. So if we're using one of the preventive products like Merit, the imidacloprid or a Celeprin, clanthamilaprol, we, um, you know, now we really want to start putting that on about the middle of June. So it's really we're in that first week of June. So another week or two, uh, probably, when we want to start putting down those applications. Again, it's always important to water it in to make sure that we get that product down, moving down into the soil profile. So we're a little early, but we're coming right up on that. I think we're going to have a little video, uh, perhaps next Thanks. week, mm -hmm. uh, talking a little bit more about white grubs, but just a little early. Thank you, Fred. <coughs> All right, Lowell, this is a viewer who actually sent us three separate images of abnormal growth on plants in the landscape. Okay. And uh, she's kind of wondering what it is, and I think we kind of figured out what it is. Yeah, on the asparagus there, that, yeah. that's a really good uh, example of the type of injury you can get from growth regulator or drift um, or some kind of movement of growth regulator uh, herbicides onto desirable plants. Um, that asparagus, you can see the twisting and bending of the stems, and that's a very typical symptom of 2,4-D and dicamba and some of those really commonly used uh, turf uh, herbicides. Um, you know, we're getting to, we're starting to get into the hottest time of the year now. So uh, we typically uh, don't really encourage folks to apply uh, 2,4-D uh, when the daytime temperatures start getting into the mid to upper 80s because the 
the herbicide can volatilize and, and move off site uh, to undesirable areas. Um, so that's why we a lot of times recommend treatments early in the season. But that's obviously a situation where somehow uh, some some herbicide drift uh, got on those on those plants. All right, thank you, Lowell. Kevin, uh, this is a viewer in Omaha, and they have an ornamental cherry. Mm -hmm. They're saying this year it's got very sparse foliage, and many of the leaves are turning sort of an orange color. Mm -hmm. They want to know what the cause is, and is there anything they can do to correct it? Well, uh, this is kind of a difficult one, and from the picture, it looks like it's some of the newer foliage, um, some of the, the, the oh. foliage on the tips of the, the plants, on the stems, that's, that's uh, developing that discoloration. Um, there is a pretty common disease um, in this part of, the, part of the country, in this part of Nebraska, called Western X disease, um, and it affects chokecherry and a lot of other prunus species. They're not actually certain um, exactly on the host range of this particular disease, but um, it's very possible that ornamental cherry is susceptible. Um, that might be what you're dealing with. It's difficult to diagnose. Um, it might be expensive um, to diagnose. I would suggest um, submitting a sample just so you know what you're dealing with. Um, the pathogen is actually a phytoplasma, so it's a kind of a virus-like organism um, that can be moved around from plant to plant uh, via insects. So if you do have other uh, prunus species in the landscape that you're looking to protect, you might want to consider replacing the tree. But uh, I would recommend a diagnosis um, that can be a little bit costly, however. So. All right, but nevertheless, you don't want to treat for what you don't have. Exactly. <clears throat> All right, Jeff, you get the uh, picture also, and this is a Millard viewer. Okay. Uh, they have an ash, and the leaves haven't really come in very well, and he started trying to figure out what was going on, on, took pictures of this area about 10 feet from the trunk, and found what he thought was some sort of a strange root rot. The okay. root is more than a hole in diameter, and the root is kind of spongy. Mm -hmm. and he, and he wonders whether the tree is worth saving or whether you think that there's something going on sure. that would cause him to want to replace that. And Kevin might want to jump in too on this. You know, I'm looking at this tree, and, and I know while we are having a nice spring, um, there are a lot of trees, and you know, we have them on campus right now, they're a little slow, mm -hmm. or they're a little thin. And I'm sure, you know, we just went through a heck of a, of a drought, so there still, right. there was some root damage done during that period. So I guess it wouldn't surprise me that that tree is suffering from some of that damage right now. Mm -hmm. um, and ash in general can be a little slow. I was looking at some honey locusts today that are very slow coming out, but they're flowering like crazy right now. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, we'll just kind of see what happens, but I'm hope, hoping they'll be fine. All right, Fred, you get the next uh, images. And again, we've, we've started getting questions about this one. Um, we have great pictures of, I think, all four stages of good, this beast. Good. Those, those are the ones you worry oh, about. Oh, yeah, and, and the question is how to control squash bugs. Okay, <laughs> squash bug. My arch me me uh, nemesis. There you go, Kevin. <laughs> nemesis in my, in my garden. Yes, uh, squash bugs can uh, for the uh, primarily summer squash, but also winter squashes is, is maybe the most serious pest we have. Again, the key to is uh, is sanitation. Uh, they overwinter as adults. Uh, those are the little uh, gray thing you saw, and you know so you know, keeping good san good sanitation in the garden reduces overwintering sites, and sort of hopefully will reduce the number the following spring. Then. Early inspection, you look for those little red, reddish brick colored clusters of eggs uh, that'll be on the underside of the leaves within the veins. So you look for those and if it's a small patch, you can just crush them or pick them off. Uh, and But once that happens, you know that those, those little larvae, the, the nymphs, are not gonna be far behind. So as soon as they hatch, that would be the time to treat them. Uh, something like a permethrin product or a bifenthrin product. Uh, any of those, we have to be very careful when we do that because it, once the squash start to flower, okay, then the honeybees are going to be and other pollinators are going to be foraging, and we don't want to kill those. So do it early in the morning or later in the evening. So all right, thanks. It's Fred a tough one. It's it is. Uh, it is. You know, my nemesis. Yeah, and those are great <laughs> pictures, by the way. I think Jim Kalish took all of those. Oh, he, he did. Is so good at taking pictures of small things. All right, Lowell, uh, this is a, a viewer who has a question about garlic. Okay. Uh, she doesn't know whether it's real garlic or wild garlic, and I think we've had several of those this year, but she wants to know whether it is, 
and if not, what do you do to get rid of it or harvest it? <laughs> or harvest it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think this one is uh, wild garlic. Um, that you can see the start of some or some very small bulbs uh, at the at the base of those plants uh, there. Um, it, if folks want to get rid of it, it's it's fairly difficult to uh, get rid of in a turf or lawn setting because the leaves are very slender and they're very upright. And it's hard to get good um, herbicide coverage uh, on those on those plants. Um, so being persistent with an application of, of a 2,4-D or growth regulator uh, type of, of product is um, is probably the herbicide way uh, to get rid of it. And um, typically, if stuff is in there lawn in terms of edibility we don't really recommend uh, <laughs> grazing, uh, grazing on, on those <laughs> but if if folks know that they haven't applied anything to their lawn and they want to sample it I suppose they can. All right thanks Lowell. Kevin uh, this is a viewer from Underwood Iowa and he has 17 knockout roses beautiful landscape there surrounded by various hostas but he says one of the roses has leaves that are turning these odd colors and the plant appears to be stunted. They're all about eight years old. Um, they've all been healthy until this year. Mm -hmm. They wanna know if we can figure this out and should he get rid of this one plant just in case. <clears throat> It might be warranted since it's, it looks like it's pretty stunted, um, you know, and, and it looks like just kind of a small little weak plant there. Um, it, to be honest, it, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to diagnose. Um, it doesn't look like any of our typical virus symptoms that we see in roses. Um, it's possible that it was, uh, you know, the result of our environmental conditions, but you would expect to see that same type of thing on all the roses, especially that close to the, to the, the affected one. So. Um, Really, I guess my best answer is I think you know you should probably submit a sample to the plant and pest diagnostic clinic and and, and get it um, get it diagnosed. Um, it it kind of looks a little bit like rose rosette. Um, that's the typical uh, the disease we look for when we see reddening of rose leaves. But usually um, the inner nodes will be shortened mm -hmm. and the leaves themselves will be smaller, and we don't really see that in that picture. So, long story short, I don't know what's going on with that particular guy. Oh. Get it out of there, maybe. Yeah, probably. Yeah, you would want to rogue it out. Rogue exactly. it out is what you would want to Which do. Which is actually what he has said. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd be tempted to take a tug on it and see, you know, if it, there is a root problem. I mean, if it, mm -hmm. if it gives easy, then you know that the root system has been compromised. compromised. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thanks, guys. Jeff, this is a viewer in Lincoln who has um, a Japanese tree lilac about 30 years old mm. and is, is getting some more dead wood and has more this year in it. Um, they're wondering if the mulch around the base is too high, the crown is exposed, they want to know if they should cut the dead out, replace the tree. Sure. Any suggestions on that? Well, um, first of all, congratulations on having a 30-year-old Japanese tree lilac. I mean, right. that's a fairly mature plant. And um, so that's one thing to keep in mind that, you know, as, as trees go, when you get into 30 years in an urban setting, you may be getting kind of towards the end of the life of that plant. So that's one thing to consider. You may not have done anything wrong, so don't blame yourself on this one. Uh, the mulch didn't look that bad to me, mm -mm. you know, so I guess if they were intent in trying to keep it going, you know, the mulch bed was maybe, again, a, a little small for me, I'd probably expand it. Um, make sure we're not putting down too much mulch. Again, kind of the whole add compost, that's my cure for a lot of things, just adding mm -hmm. something to help the roots along. And of course, we want to prune the dead out of it. Right. That'd probably be what I'd recommend. Give it another year, see what happens. Okay, uh, Fred, you have images <clears throat> of somebody who thinks they have spittle bugs. Oh, that'd be a spittle bug. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they, you know, they're kind of fascinating, but yeah. they wonder, do they do a lot of damage and should they be con controlled in any way? Uh, that's obviously on juniper. Uh, so, you know, they really don't cause a lot of damage. It's a little homopteran insect, uh, and they produce this, they use the plant sap, and they produce this little mass of spittle. They hide inside, and that serves as protection. So they're embedded within this mass. Certainly is a good way to ward off natural enemies and uh, curious humans. It generally won't pick them out. So, again, not to worry about them. If they were be very abundant, hosing them off, just taking a spray from the garden hose and washing it down, that would remove most of them. So, yeah, not, not an issue. So they must be host specific, as you mentioned, juniper spittle bug? Well, of many them of them are, but you know, we see them most commonly in Nebraska on uh, juniper. Okay. But there's lots of different spittle bugs on different plants. All right, thanks, Fred. Um, Lowell, <coughs> this is 
a, an identification of a weed and how do you control it? Question. Uh -huh, okay. Uh, before one of you brings it in and starts throwing it at one <laughs> I, another. I, I didn't bring that one in, Fred. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, uh, bed straw, catchweed uh, bed straw, and it, it's kind of a cool plant. Uh, it's it's actually very kind of sticky to the touch, and if you put it on like your sleeve or something like that, it, it will stick there. It, it's an annual species. Um, can be a problem in uh, mulch beds, uh, places like that. Um, it's fairly easy to, to control. Early in the spring, uh, some Roundup, uh, if you're looking for chemical control, or uh, just a hoe or a rake, once it gets a little size, um, is pretty easy to take care of. All right, thank you, Lowell. Kevin, a San Marzano tomato plant mm. planted about <clears throat> two, two and a half weeks ago, and this is in Omaha, mm -hmm. is looking like this. Mm. And the viewer wants to know if this is something that she should be concerned about, or is mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. not? Well, she might, um, looking at the picture, it kind of, you know, the lesions are small. Um, they seem to be kind of a tannish color. Um, that's, u that's usually what septoria looks like. Uh, septoria is a foliar fungal uh, disease of tomato. Um, either way, I, I believe that is definitely some kind of a foliar fun fungal disease um, on your tomatoes there. Uh, those guys like to overwinter in the residue, um, so cleaning up um, your garden area will, will help reduce the amount of inoculum um, for next year. Um, in terms of this year, there are products available um, that you can apply that are, are pretty effective in controlling that particular fungus. Um, any product with uh, ingredients uh, Maneb, Mancozeb, or Chlorothalonil. Um, will be active against septoria. So um, you might want to just look at the spray recommendations and, and consider treating um, you know, prior to fruiting. All right, thank you, Kevin. Jeff, we've had a couple of questions about a, a ground cover in the woodland, and, and unfortunately our pictures are not, are not really good on that one. We think it's Virginia water leaf. Okay. Are you familiar with that plant? And the question from one viewer is, how do we control it? And from right. the other is, hmm. How do yeah. you encourage it? Well, Virginia water leaf is something that you kind of see. It's east of here, but it's uh, common like in the Mississippi, upper Mississippi Valley region. So Minnesota, Michigan, northern Illinois, that sort of area. And so it's a deciduous forest kind of thing. And, and I think within that setting, within a native setting, it's a nice ground cover. Uh, and probably is nice to see when you're out walking on the path. It gets the same because it has little white spots on the leaves that look like watermarks sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, that said, in a cultivated situation, so in our gardens, it can be prolific and spread quite quickly and then hard to control after that. So, you know, if, uh, if you plant it, uh, you get what you get. You know, you may end up with something that's really going to take over. So if you're looking for a ground cover, if you have a, a situation that you're trying to manage, it may not be the best choice. Okay, Fred, you're getting an, um, an, an ID question from a viewer, and she said she took this on May 20th. Okay, yep. And just, yep. she kind of wonders what it is. Uh, that's a, that's a, one of the tiger moths, uh, and the, the caterpillar is a little fuzzy caterpillar that we usually would call a woolly bear. You know, not the black and brown one, but it's, it's one of the woolly bear caterpillars. Those caterpillars feed on Oh, a wide, wide array of uh, weedy vegetation, so they're, they're never a pest. Uh, well, usually not a pest. And though I've seen them on the water lilies in my, in my, my water garden, rarely. But again, it's just a pretty little caterpillar, a little moth called a tiger moth. Great, thank you, Fred. All right, uh, Lowell, we have um, people wondering what this particular plant is, and you just happen to have a piece in your bucket as well as the yeah. image of kind of a small rosette there, and then how do you control it? <clears throat> um, yeah, um, <clears throat> this prickly lettuce, uh, and it, it really has become quite visible in the last oh, week to 10 days uh, out there. Um, it can germinate in the fall. And in the spring, I think most of the spring germination, it, it was mostly spring germination uh, this year. And one of the cool things about this is on the underside of the leaf, you can see all, all the spines uh, on the underside of the leaf uh, right there. And that's a dead giveaway uh, for prickly lettuce. Those spines will be there on, on pretty small plants. Uh, um, Right now is really not the best time to control it with, with chemicals because it's getting to the end of its life cycle. They're, they're pretty big plants out there right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we typically recommend control uh, in the fall or early in the spring with a growth regulator type of herbicide. It's very easy to control when it's very small. 
All right. And I, if you're going to hand pull them, wear gloves. Exactly. And they're yeah. easy to pull. Yeah, yeah they are easy know. to pull. All the Dorothy Lynch in the world won't help that lettuce. No, no it's, it, yeah, <laughs> no. yeah, it's, it's not no. going to work. Yeah. I had a student who heard me say the word lettuce and didn't hear what preceded it and huh. took a nice uh, bite out of it, and that was <laughs> not a good experience. <laughs> okay, Kevin, it's, it's mushroom season, mm -hmm. and we're not talking morels. Uh, we have a viewer in Syracuse who has the fungi in her garden, and we have one, uh, we don't know where this one is, but little toadstools all over the lawn, and we have a third one in Brainerd, mm -hmm. all saying, um, lots do? of them, what do we do? What do we do? Um, well, first off, um, you know, chemicals are not the way to go um, for treating these, these problems. Um, Usually you have to broadcast something to the lawn or to the garden where these guys are at, and um, the the base of this the, of this fungus of these fungi that produce these basidiocarps, um, they're located um, usually four to six inches below the soil, so it's really difficult to get that product down um, to the to where the mass of of, of the fungus is is really prevalent. Um, the best thing to do is just if they're in the lawn, just mow them off. Um, you know, eventually that fungus is going to exhaust itself. Um, so time is your friend. Uh, eventually, you know, they're, they're probably going to come back again next year and maybe even the year after that. But eventually they will run out of energy and they won't be able to produce those, those mushrooms anymore. Um, in the garden, uh, what you can do is, is till the garden. Um, there are other fungi in the soil that can kind of compete with these uh, mushroom producers. And um, if you put them in close proximity to each other by, by disturbing that soil, um, that can that can help control the, the mushroom producers. So, um, and then we have a lot of questions too on whether or not they're poisonous. Well, it, it really depends on 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 what the fungus is. So I would I wouldn't recommend eating any of them that you find in the lawn or garden without consulting a professional. If you didn't plant it, don't put it in your mouth. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jeff. You also have a couple of images. This is a okay. viewer in Papillion. Need some advice on tree planting. Mm -hmm. uh, northeast and southeast corners of her yard, and this is clearly new construction, mm -hmm. um, refuse to grow trees. First trees were frontier elms. The most recent were fall fiesta maples. Mm -hmm. The corners get plenty of sun and wind, and the sprinkler system is hitting them. Mm -hmm. um, any ideas? Well, I, you know, there's some positives here again. They have nice big mulch <coughs> beds. So the kind of things that we like to recommend were shrubs and trees in a mulch area. So they're not competing directly with the turf. So they're doing a lot of right things. And they've picked out some, some nice plants that they've put in there that failed, unfortunately. But at least they have some good tree selections. You know, my, my thoughts are there's a, a pretty good slope there. So if you're relying on your sprinkler system to do the watering on these trees, that may be the, the mistake. So either we're getting too much moisture there or my guess is we're getting runoff and we're not getting anything into the root zone itself. It's keeping, you know, it's keeping the grass wet but not really watering the trees. Mm -hmm. And that would be my thought, is that um, with our replacement trees that we purposely water these individually versus relying on the irrigation system to do that. All right, Fred, you have uh, the first question after the break there. Um, this is a viewer who has a green and white striped iris, so a variegated iris of some sort, and, um, she, and, and that's the foliage. She wanted to move some of them, and then she found some hollow corms and some bitty holes on the underside of the corms, the rhizomes. Okay. So what, what do you think? Okay, well, the, the holes in the corms are probably iris porum. We just watched uh, Jeff's excellent mm -hmm. video on uh, iris. He talked about iris spore. Uh, so again, the time this fall, that, you know, that probably is time to renovate that iris bed and clean those out and follow uh, Jeff's instructions and, and deal with the iris spore. The little bitty holes, I suspect that the, those corms are, some of them are, have died, they're kind of decaying. And so those are probably maggots, you know, that are just sort of feeding on that decaying uh, material. And that's, you know, how that material, organic material is broken down. So I don't think, you know, the big holes in the corms and the little holes uh, that, were, that uh, viewers seeing are connected. Okay, thanks, Fred. <clears throat> All right, Lowell, this is a viewer who uh, says that they have large patches of weeds in their turf that include creeping Charlie, crabgrass, and another one. They want to know what they can use to kill the weeds, but not the good turf. And then, how long can they wait to reseed? Um, that's a 
that's an hour show <laughs> <I know. laughs> on its own, I, I think. Um, so let's start off with, with the Creeping Charlie. Um, it's a perennial. It, it Best time to uh, control that is in the fall. Uh, second best time would be applica or herbicide application in the spring. And using the active uh, product with the active ingredient triclopyr in it is pretty important uh, if you're going to attempt to control uh, Creeping Charlie uh, there. The crabgrass, um, if you didn't put down a pre-emergence uh, product, uh, you can try to control that uh, post-emergence uh, now with either drive or uh, tenacity. Uh, those, those can be effective uh, on, on that. Um, crabgrass is, a, is an annual species, so there's probably a lot of seed there. Uh, and they'll have to do that each year. Um, and then the important thing is once they've gotten all of this maybe controlled is getting good turf established in there. And if they're using a cool season turf, uh, get it established early. Um, probably in the uh, uh, August, September time frame. Uh, look at look at reseeding those areas because you can't get, if you don't replace the weeds with turf, you're just going to get more weeds back uh, gotcha. in there. All right, thanks Lowell. Uh, Kevin, this is a Lincoln viewer that has a question about a tomato plant. The bottom looks fine, but the top leaves curl, although they mm -hmm. stay green. The top of the plant is affected. Did this last year also, okay. but does say there's new soil. New soil. Maybe the same cultivar. Mm -hmm. It's possible that there is something going on with the root system that'll cause just the upper leaves to curl. Um, I, I know there are probably a list of different insects too, and I could bounce this over to Fred af after this, um, that will cause curling on tomatoes. Um, I would um, uh, do the tug test, make sure that the, the root system isn't compromised. Mm -hmm. If it's not, then we might want to explore the insect side. Well, yeah, let's open up, let's uncurl those leaves and see what's inside. I mean, it could be thrips, uh, leaf hoppers, aphids, there are a number of, of insects that will cause leaf curling. So yeah. a little more investigation. Yeah, there, I, I forgot too, there is a, there is a viral disease that will cause leaf, leaf curling as well. Um, that's hard to diagnose. There is a test kit for it though available. So again, sample submission. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Great. Jeff, this is a poke viewer. Speaking of tomatoes, this viewer has uh, the tops of the tomato plants were killed by a spray, so it must have been an herb, an, an herbicide of some sort. Broccoli and cauliflower the same. The peppers actually have tiny peppers on them. She wants to know if those vegetable plants that were damaged by the herbicide could will recover. Uh, well, potentially. I mean, we're, we're in pretty good weather conditions right now. So I, I guess with any of these, I would look at removing the damaged plant material and getting those off the plants. That would be my first suggestion. And then you could wait and see, make sure you're not over irrigating, but make sure that they're well irrigated and the plants are protected. So, and then again, you know, back to the other tomato question, that would be the other thing, just a, just kind of a hint of 2,4-D in the air is enough to right. curl, you know, any of the, the tomatoes, so. All right, okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, Fred, we have a viewer who, uh, from Southwest Iowa, they have a Japanese lilac, must be a tree, and they think the lightning bugs are eating the flowers. Uh, not possible. Light, okay. Lightning beetles are all that we have in Nebraska are all predaceous. They eat other insects, so that's not not possible. Now, if the flowers are being damaged, you know, might want to go out uh, and and look at the flowers, take a close inspection, uh, and as you know, Jim Kalish talked about that a little bit, and you know, see what's actually causing the damage. But it won't be the lady beetles. Don't spray lady or uh, lightning beetles. All right. Thanks, Fred. Lowell, we're about out of time, but we have a viewer in Pawnee City that wants to know how you can control clover, bindweed, and dandelions in strawberries. Ooh, uh, very <laughs> difficult in strawberries because broadleaf crop, broadleaf weeds, mm -hmm. the best products on those weeds are, are broadleaf killers. Uh, there's really not a selective way to, to take it out. And I think the question talked about a uh, renovating a, another mm -hmm. area and that might be their, their best approach on that. Okay, and so if, they, if they're worried about those weeds in that area? Um, it, they can start it off clean uh, by applying a fairly heavy uh, dose of Roundup and then good mulch in those areas. It's really important to keep the weeds down. 